Okay, guys, welcome back to Slasher Street Podcast, and I am absolutely delighted to be joined by another special guest, and uh, this one is a real bucket list special guest for me here on Slasher Street Podcast. Anyone who listens to the podcast would know I'm a huge fan of this man's work, and that is, of course, the man behind the fantastic The Barn, The Barn Part 2, Scream Team Releasing, that is Mr. Justin M. Seaman. So, Justin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate it. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. It's like say, it's a, a real privilege to have you on. And uh, anyone who's listened to the podcast for a while knows how much of a big fan I am of the barn. Uh, I'm a massive advocate for all for everything you do. And uh, yeah, so this is awesome to get, get you on and have a chat about everything, everything the barn and Scream Team and everything you've done. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So now normally I would start the podcast with a bit of a, you know, have you always been a fan of horror? But I know that you have always been a fan of horror since a, a little kid. So I'll I'll reword this question for you specifically in that how do you remember how you fell in love with horror and kind of what really made you go into that genre? Um yeah, so I, I would have to say uh, uh on on a personal level it goes back to that my parents were divorced. Um, so my mother worked a lot. She was a waitress. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, home alone uh, with my grandparents. Um, so, you know, I, I got to, to watch whatever was on TV. Usually they, they would play these um, movies on, we had a channel called Fox 53. Uh, and that's how I kind of stumbled upon uh, these obscure movies like Freaked or Legend uh, things that as a little kid, you know, I was like, what is this clicking through the, you know, the channels. Um, but also when I would go to my dad's house, uh, my mom ne- wouldn't necessarily let me rent scary movies as a little kid, but it was fair game at my dad's house. He's like, anything you want to rent, you can rent. So uh, my mom didn't know the kind of stuff I was watching when I went away for the weekend. Uh, you know, so when I came home and I'd want to watch scary movies, my mom was like, you know, you can watch the monster squad, which I absolutely love, you know? But when I went to my, my dad's house, it was, you know, I'm going to watch uh, Nightmare on Elm Street or Return of the Living Dead or Trick or Treat uh, or Night of the Demons, stuff like that, which my mom would have absolutely like, sh- shit her pants if she knew that I was watching those things at like six years old or something, six, seven years old, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Because I think on a lot of the uh, kind of uh, the footage that you've showed on the barn and the Blu-ray and kind of like the making of, there's like footage of you dressed up as Freddy from like you were seven or eight. Uh, I yeah. presume that was at your dad's house then. Well, my mom made the costume because she thought he doesn't know what Freddy is. So I'll let him, uh, you know, dress as Freddy because, you know, every, all, all the older kids do it. But I knew exactly who Freddy Krueger was and I wanted to. So she made me the costume. She didn't want to go buy it because she thought it'd be a waste going and spending that kind of money because I didn't know who Freddy Krueger was. Uh, but I knew 100% who he was. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. But so, it was, that, was, that was the deal. It was like, don't tell your mom what, what, we're, what you watch here and I'll let you keep yeah. watching it. I was like, okay. You know? I think and then, uh, uh, as a dad myself, I mean, I can totally you know engage with that because I just know that when my – little kid gets to you know seven or eight and she's like dad i want to i want to watch horror films i'm just like i have a a horror kind of room here at the house and there's like Mm -hmm. posters and uh, the barn poster is on the wall and terrifying she loves chucky she's only three and a half and she loves chucky she has no idea what chucky is but she has a little chucky toy and it's just yeah it's so awesome when kids get into it that age without knowing as well Um, so have you always wanted to be in the business of making movies as well? So how did you transition from being a horror fan into today making movies? Yeah. Um, uh, as long as I can remember, um, I've always wanted to make movies. I didn't know it was going to turn into a career, but when I was a little kid, we had a family camcorder and I, I made movies with that. Uh, and I remember being in school, it may have been kindergarten or first grade. And they did this thing of like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, and originally at the time, I liked to draw a lot. And I told I, I told the, the teacher that uh, I, I wanted to be a person that that draw comic books and cartoons. So they were like, oh, you want to be a cartoonist? So I was like, I guess. But then by the next year, I was so in, captivated by uh, how movies were being made because um, I think I saw uh, there was a VHS that came out of night, the making of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4. Uh, it was like a special VHS that they put out. 
and it showed all the behind the scenes of how they were making it. And that's that's kind of the reason why I wasn't afraid of scare of, of horror films because of that VHS. And like the there was a VHS of the making of Thriller, and they showed you how everything happened, like how they made it. Uh, and I felt I one it it taught me as a little kid to not be afraid of things because it was people behind masks. But I was so intrigued by how all, all these people came together, and it was a team that made that stuff on the screen. Uh, and I was I was captivated by it. So uh, going back to probably about seven or eight years old, uh, I've, I've always wanted to make movies. Uh, they haven't always been horror films, but I, I've just always uh, been drawn to, you know, wanting to create things and tell stories. Awesome. And then obviously <clears throat> 2016, uh, the big the big debut of The Barn. Um, yeah. So how did the idea of The Barn come about because I think uh, for people who might not know it goes back well to your childhood so how, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. how did that all come about for you and then uh, to make the jump to make the movie as well yeah so like I said in, in the beginning um, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents house when my mom was at work um, especially in the summers so there was wasn't a lot, a lot to do it was, it was in the countryside uh, so it was a lot of playing outside you know playing with action figures trying to do something um, but I also, I'd like to draw. So I'd, I'd make these little storybooks of, you know, different stories about, you know, whatever, almost like comic books. Um, and then one day around, uh, close to fall, I was on the back porch of, of the house and I was looking up through the woods and the foliage had started to fall. And I was just, I don't know why, but I was paying attention more closely than I, I normally would as a kid. And I noticed that there was this barn way out on the hillside I'd never noticed before. And it was really creepy looking. And um, my imagination just started going and I started thinking about what could be in this barn, you know, uh, what's protecting this barn. And it, it just, uh, it uh, kind of took off from there where it was like, you know, if there's a barn up there, there's probably a cornfield. And if there's a cornfield, there's probably uh, a scarecrow that's protecting the crops. And if there's a cornfield, there's gotta be a pumpkin patch. So there's gotta be a pumpkin man. And then there's got to be a guy who protects that barn. And I, I bet you he's some sort of a miner that dug his way out of hell. You know, uh, <laughs> he's there and they're and they're just a group. But I was also heavily, uh, heavily influenced at the time by Goosebumps because it was like 1993. Um, I think I was probably like in third or fourth grade. And uh, that was the thing. Um, so when I wrote the story, it, it was very much uh, a group of kids that were like 11, 12 years old. Uh, which were older kids for me uh, that were battling these goosebump type monsters in this town. Uh, and then I just, uh, I wrote that story and then I wrote a sequel story a couple years later and then a part three that I never really finished because I got older. Um, and then I just kind of put them away. And then in probably 2009 or 2010, when my wife and I were moving into our house that we bought, I was getting all kinds of stuff from my mother's house and she kept all these things like my drawings and all this stuff from as a kid and the books were in there. And I was like, Oh, I forgot about these things. You know I mean? I, over years, you know, I, 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 we tried to do stuff in high school, like make little short films, but I, it went back to the root and I started reading the books and I was like, man, these are, these are terrible because they're a little kid wrote them. Um, but there was something about them that like, uh, it, it made me want to go out and make that film again and but keep it like the essence of the story of like mm -hmm. the little kid story that was in there um so in 2013 i told my wife i said look this sounds crazy uh i know we have a house and all this but i really want to make this movie so i think i'm going to quit my job uh and kind of max out our credit cards and our savings and make this movie and it's going to change our lives and uh, worst case scenario, we lose it all. <laughs> you know, we lose our house, right? Yeah. Uh, but but I feel like this could be, you know, really, really positive and we, this might change our lives for the better. Uh, and then anything that could go wrong with that movie went wrong, uh, production wise. So I thought um, from 2013 to 2015, I was uh, super depressed. And I was like, this was the biggest mistake I ever made. I should have never attempted to make this movie. Um, but thankfully, things fell into place and, and it worked out. Uh, and the movie got done. Uh, and uh, and it found like a, a, a weird cult following. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's 
the barn, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I get to tell you this, actually, because I've said it on the podcast, so it's cool that I get to tell you kind of face-to-face that the, the barn for me is one of my favourite movies, really, of the past decade. I just think it's so well done, and I actually just watched it tonight just before I came on here, and uh, it's just it's just something about it that makes you feel, like, you know, good when you watch it. It's just so, like... Um, I don't know what what's the best word to describe it, but like homely, you know. It just it just it's a nice film to put on, and it's just super fun. And oh, uh, obviously, you. it's got this huge cult following now, and uh, it's it's you know for me changed the game in indie horror. I just think a lot of oh. people are now trying to copy the recipe that you created back in twenty sixteen. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, because you did an Indiegogo campaign, was it for? Did you do an Indiegogo campaign for the original, or was that just you self funding that one? So we self-funded it, uh, and then when everything fell apart, um, we were trying to piece it back together, mm-hmm. and I had no money. So we took the, you know, hate to say we lied a little <laughs> bit, but we took the route of uh, we need some finishing funds to finish this movie, when in reality it was we need money to restart this movie, because mm-hmm. uh, that's what we basically had to do. Um, and, uh, cause uh, we, th- there's a long story. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, we were at a stage where I hired people that weren't in it for the right reasons. Uh, they, you know, they were there for a paycheck and, uh, the footage did not look good. So we essentially had to go back and reshoot a little bit over half of the, of the movie and start over, which meant bringing back the cast. And, you know, it was, a, it was a, a lot of money. Uh, mm-hmm. and it was, a lot to swallow because everybody kind of thought things were going well, including me until I got into post-production and started looking at some stuff and was like, wow, this is shit. Uh, So we did the Indiegogo and we basically were like, there are some scenes we need, we'd like to add in, which we did. We did shoot those scenes, but we essentially had to go back and shoot the rest of the movie again. Um, So if it wasn't for the Indiegogo, I think we raised like Mm 15,000 and that was just scraping by. To, to get that movie finished again. And we had already spent like almost 30 the first time around, um, which the movie should have been finished at 30. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it ended up being like a $47,000 movie. Um, lesson learned, you know, for, especially yeah. for the sequel. Lesson learned for the sequel. Yeah. So, I mean, because you came out the other end, you came out with an absolutely phenomenal product. And I, yeah. I feel like every everyone... Uh, who was on board. And I think that's the good thing that you were saying there about the cast coming back. Um, I get the impression that everyone who was working on the film was in, you know, they were buying into what you were doing because, you know, they came back, you know, you, you reshot the scenes and everyone was like really passionate about your project. How was that when you were trying to get them back to do that? Yeah. So, um, so what happened was one of, one of the people that I hired, um, I didn't know, who's now become like a really good friend. We've been friends for almost a decade now. He, uh, he was part of the group that messed up things. He wasn't one of the people that messed up, but he was, he was part of the group that came in. He, he was, he knew those people. And um, so after we had kind of wrapped, the movie hadn't been completed. Uh, he called me, it was probably about a month or so later. And I, I knew I hadn't told anybody, uh, even my wife, like how bad things were. I was just kind of like sinking into a bathtub uh, contemplating life uh like uh oh i told my wife you know we were going to mortgage the house and you know worst case we'll lose the house and now i'm like oh shit we're going to lose the house uh so it was all kind of hitting me so he, he called me up his name was zane um he's he's the guy i'm working I've, I've done a ton of projects with doing cryptids with and everything right now but um he called me up and he was like hey how's it going and i'm like what is this guy calling me for <laughs> you know <laughs> is, he, is he checking in to see just how bad things have, are going for me um, and I just, you know, we started talking. I said, Hey, I said that dude, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was like, it's, it's bad. It's, I, you know, the movies not obviously you were there, you know, we didn't finish, but what we did shoot isn't finished, you know, it was bad. And he, and, and he wasn't a main camera op at the time. He was a, a B camera op. And so everything he shot looked really good. And, um, and so he was like, well, he's like, what are you going to do? I said, it's over. The movie's done. And, uh, he said, well, you know, I'm willing to come back you know, no charge. He's like, why don't you talk to the, uh, the rest of the cast and see if you can get them back. And I was just like, I don't even know how to approach that 
topic with these people, you know, cause these were, these weren't friends. None of these people were friends. They were all hired actors, you know, like I went through agencies, you know, this isn't, that's a conversation you could have with a buddy, you know, like, Hey man, yeah. I know we, I know we, we messed around for, you know, a couple weeks, you know, but now we got to do it again. Haha. <laughs> um, but uh, no. So I contacted all these actors and I just told them the situation and thankfully they all kind of saw it happening, the bad stuff happening, you know, behind the scenes that I really wasn't aware of. And they all were like, look, we see how passionate you are, how much this movie means to you. Like, you know, you wrote this when you were a kid and uh, we don't want to see it not get completed. So we'll all come back. Uh, so, you know, we took care of, you know, travel and lodging and, you know, all that stuff. again because even that adds up. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody came back for free uh, just just to see the project get completed, which I was like, that's that's amazing that they did that for, for me, you know, as a person, like to know that I must have did something right and left a, a mark on them for them to want to come back and help me start over yeah. <laughs> essentially. And then when we started over, it was a blast. Once once we removed the the bad people that weren't there for the right reasons and the people who wanted to be there for the right reasons, it, it was a total blast. And I think that that's what came across in the film and on the, on the screen is the fun. Yeah, 100%. And like I say, it is a super fun film. It's got a massive cult following now. Could you, When you were making this film, could you have imagined kind of this kind of fan base that you've now created, uh, uh, that people are so passionate about the barn and what you do? Could you even imagine it at the time? No. So people ask me, you know, I don't know how, how much you've looked into the movie, but I did a, I did a huge like eighties marketing campaign where it was oh, like yeah. board, board game, video game, uh, like these big wrestling buddies, action figures, vinyl sound, you know, all this stuff. That was pure desperation of uh, now that this movie's done and I, it's gone way over. Uh, I have to make a big splash. I have to basically be the guy in the crowd waving my arms saying, Hey, look at me, look at me. Uh, because, you know, a, a horror film comes out like every week, you know, of, of people yeah. I know. And it's like, how do you get noticed? Uh, so doing that, uh, I, I, you know, every horror website at the time was like, who is this guy? What is this movie? Check this out. Whether people dug the look of it, dug the trailer or not, they were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Um my thing was I just didn't want to lose my house <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or get divorced. Um, so it was, it was a pure hustle of like, I have to make my money back. I don't care about a profit. I just don't want to uh, lose everything that I've built with my, my wife uh, over the last, you know, years together. Um, but I never expected people to actually, in, you know, truly enjoy the film. I thought they might dig it or, you know, they might say that was cool, whatever I've, you know, it could have been better, but, but people genuinely started coming to me and uh, finding me at conventions or film fests and saying how much they liked it, how much they loved the film and then asking about sequels. And at the mm -hmm. time I was like, there's no way I'm ever making a sequel because that was a nightmare. Uh, I'm never revisiting the barn. Um, but over the course of like the next two years, it happened so much that I finally said, if people really want a continuational story, you know, that I can do, then I'm going to make an all or nothing campaign on Indiegogo. And if they fund it, I'll make it. And I never in a million years thought that they would fund it. <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you, I really didn't. I thought it was just bullshit. You know, we have people that come to conventions and say, they'll walk around the first time and they'll say something like, um, are you going to be here all weekend? Yeah, we'll be here all weekend. Okay, I'll come back and get this before the end of the weekend. I'll never see them the rest of the weekend. Yeah. So I just assumed that that's all it was. It was just people, you know, blowing smoke saying, yeah, yeah, I'll, I want to back the movie. I'll do it. And, but they did. So yeah. I, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still actually shocked that people wanted, you know, they liked the first one so much they wanted to see another story. Yeah. And the second one, I think I've got it written down here, actually, it was uh, $56,000 it raised, just over $56,000 on an Indiegogo campaign for yeah. part two absolutely incredible like uh, fan phenomenal number i mean that that just shows kind of where the franchise has gone in the last three or four yeah, years and, and you know what's crazy is probably nine thousand dollars of that is per perk fulfillment mm -hmm. you know like just the stuff i have to send out to people and then i think we did like another ten thousand dollars in shipping expenses oh. so that was so there was almost 20, uh, somewhere around $20,000 of that budget that was just wiped. Um, so we, we raised some money outside of the Indiegogo, like with investors and stuff. But I think 
we made the sequel for less, just a little bit less than we made the original one. Uh, oh, nice. Just just because of, it, you know, not, not having issues. Yeah. But when you look at the sequel compared to the first one, everything that we were able to bring into the sequel, uh, like actor wise and location wise and stuff like that, especially shooting through the pandemic, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it's pretty incredible for me, at least just budgeting. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Well, we'll get on to part two in just a few moments, but I just wanted to ask about um, the original as well, because obviously you played the boogeyman in <laughs> yeah. the original film, and uh, I think you played, did you play him in the second film as well? Yeah, yeah. You played in both films. So how, like, how was that? Because this is your first feature film uh, mm -hmm. that you're directing, you're writing, it's your money on the line, and you're essentially playing a starring role in it as one of the main villains, so how challenging was that to balance that kind of scale? Yet, yet again, part of the nightmare. Um, <laughs> the guy who was supposed to be the boogeyman backed out the week before shooting. Um, so we were scrambling because we're like, that was, we were like, this is the only one that needs makeup all the time. This, at this character, who is going to be here consistently that will do it. And we know they're going to show up. They're because if they if they don't show up on any given day that this character this monster's in a scene, then we're screwed. And finally, I just said, you know what? I know I'm going to be here. I will do it. Um, and then that became so much harder uh, trying to do that. And you know, because you've got contacts in, you've got these teeth, so you can't talk. I'm trying to go behind the camera and look at things. I'm trying to direct actors. Um, you know, all all while we're fighting each other. And um, it, as much as it was fun and, you know, it's cool to talk about at the time, I was like, man, did I, did I mess up again? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I should have, I should have really started uh, like pounding pavement and trying to find like some local people like that, you know, from the problem was, is we really shot the movie in October mm -hmm. and anybody that would do that kind of stuff, they all had jobs at haunted houses around here. So they're all like, Oh you know, if you shoot it in uh, in August or if you shoot it in no end of November, I'm good. And we're like, we're actually shooting this like beginning of October. So it's a, it's shot during fall and everybody was it was busy. Now, when we went back and did the reshoots, we had to shoot some things, I think, maybe in the spring. But none of that included monster stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't plan on it for the sequel. Kind of the same exact situation. I was going to have somebody else do it. Before we started to do the head casts for the monsters, that individual backed out as well. And I, I, just, I just thought, I'm not spending all this money on head casts and life, you know, molds of people's heads. I said, I'll just do it again. Uh, yeah. That was a lot easier this time around. So, oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Now, if I ever get to a part three, I, I think that's when I'm done. Somebody else can just do it because it is, it is really hard because I shot a lot of part two myself. So there was a lot of times when you don't see the boogeyman's face that it's somebody else in the oh, costume, okay. you know, without the mask on, just the wig and the, the helmet and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that might, I suppose, for the if, if you do make a part three, you would imagine that there'd be loads of people wanting to play the Boogeyman now because there'd be people <laughs> banging down your door to play that role. Yeah, you, you would think, till they, till they get to, into a movie and they see how hot it is and how long it takes. And Yeah, and... Uh, very true. Now, one thing I wanted to ask about the van, I've got the, uh, the oh, my screen screen there is terrible. I've got the van right <laughs> here. Um, yeah. And... I think the thing that a lot of people say about the band before it came out, you released like the, the obviously the as you said there the, the toys, the the board games. Uh, there was like an NES USB game as well. It was coming out, uh, and yeah. obviously the poster is absolutely phenomenal. Poster for part two is phenomenal as well. Um, so, how did you come up with the design of the poster? Because that's I think what kind of bought people bought into that without even mm. seeing anything. They saw the poster, was like holy shit, this looks fantastic so i was searching for uh somebody who could make that old school vhs type poster um i originally was going to reach out to the dude designs i think he's i think he's in the uk um uh, tom thomas hodge oh um, yes yeah yeah um he was super busy at the time um so i started looking around and i picked up a, an issue of fangoria magazine and I came across this whole like two or three pages about sadist art designs with Mark Schoenbach. And I was like, this is great. Uh, so I contacted him. He was also busy, uh, but his price was really, really good. So I was like, well, um, you know, do you think you could do something with what I have? And I told him, I said, I, I kind of want uh, 
a nighttime fire look, campfire story look that's reminiscent to the Monster Squad, like I was telling because I'm a fan of it, um, but more horror film, you know, oriented. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. So when he brought that back to me, I was like, oh, this is perfect. This looks exactly like a movie that I would have picked up at a video store strolling through the aisles as a kid. And I would have been sold on it just from the cover. You know, the movie could have absolutely sucked, but I would have loved, I would have, I would have rented it just off that cover alone. And that's, that's what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but sure I also told him I, I wanted it to be true to the movie. I said, I want it to be rep a good representation of the movie, like nothing false about it and all that stuff. So, yeah. Definitely. And like you say, you nail it with both of them. The, the cover on both and even the the reverse covers are fantastic as well. Like because then Graham Humphreys was there, came in as well. Yes. Um, yeah. And a, another fellow Brit who uh, I often see at conventions here. Uh, he's a fantastic artist. So how did your relationship with Graham come about? Because obviously you're from completely other end of the world. Yeah. To <laughs> there was um uh, I'm gonna forget the name now. There was a screening somewhere in Britain. Uh, and he attended it. And then when it was over, he contacted me and he said he saw the movie. He loved it. He wanted to know if we could collaborate on something. And I told him, I said, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so I had seen, I mean, obviously he has, he has a lot of artwork, um, but I had seen some of his most recent stuff. And I said, I'm looking for a combination of some of these colors that you did on this one and this and that. And I said, and, uh, here's the move, you know, here's a file of the movie. I said, and here's some of the characters I would like, but, he wanted to do like, you know, you look at Graham's work, his, his, he's very, very detailed. Uh, yeah. His people and monsters and everything, they look exactly like them. Um, so when he came back with the, the, the first illustration with the decapitated heads and the, the head of lantern and all that, I was like, this is incredible. Uh, so I wanted to do whatever I could with that, you know, the poster, the at some point, the sleeve, which we just put out the, the slip cover. Um, but yeah, so I, when uh, I had the opportunity for part two, I was like, I have to reach back out to him again to have a, you know, a companion cover for part two. Cause it's just an incredible piece of work. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Graham is awesome. Awesome guy yeah. as well. And a cool guy to talk to. I see him at like horror con and stuff like that here in the UK. He always, he, what he does is a horror con in uh, Sheffield and uh, it's kind of one of the original horror cons here in the UK. And every year he does like a special poster with, so for each guest that are on, he does like, um, he designs a poster that has like everyone on and it's kind of like as if it's a movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Author, and he, and he signs them all. And yeah, he's a super, super cool guy. So he's an awesome guy to get on. And like the yeah. artwork is absolutely phenomenal. Um, now, obviously the movie is set. Uh, what I like about the band as well, set in the eighties, it feels eighties. Everything about it feels eighties, even down to the burn marks on the film. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. that I just think again, other People have tried to do that and failed. It just doesn't work. Whereas for some reason with the barn, it just fits perfectly. So having to set it in the eighties, what kind of challenges did you face there? Because I think your wife had to go and do the costumes. And uh, again, she absolutely nails that because it yeah. feels totally eighties. So what kind of challenges did that kind of throw up for you? Yeah. So um, one was locations um thankfully there are there are some places nearby with within an hour or so like the roller rink um that never changed and they were still in operation so uh, i knew i wanted to go there um uh but the uh i have i have some friends that have houses that are they're relatively old uh so i just asked them i was like hey you know could we use your house and then they were all kind of like, well, we, you know, we'd have to fix some things up to make it look pretty. I'm like, no, no, no. I want it to look exactly like this. It looks like something from like the wonder years or, you know, or something like that, you know, yeah. it has that old, an old look like they're really older houses. Um, so it was, it, it was kind of coming down to finding locations that had color palettes that we liked, but with the clothing, um, we hit up thrift stores and, uh, that's when we found Michelle's jacket, it was just in a thrift store, like in the back. And, uh, it looked like an Easter jacket, but I loved the colors because it was like pink and blue and white. And that was it. It was just, um, it was before we cast anybody and it was that one size. I think it's like a small, and we were just hoping that if whoever Michelle was, she was a very petite girl because I, I really wanted to use that jacket. Cause you know, that was, it was either we use that or we make one. And thankfully we got Lexi drips and she fit perfectly in that costume. But the rest of the guys, uh, we, we bought tons of clothes. Uh, Russell's clothes were actually like, he has a whole sweatsuit. 
uh, with like chains and stuff that all came from a thrift store. Um, but like Sam and Josh and Chris, we did custom clothing for them. My, my, my wife did, uh, like I designed stuff and we put them on the, like, uh, logos and things like you know, the demon inferno the trick-or-treat uh helen's valley baseball the uh and then the, we made custom uh letterman's jackets and stuff like that so uh i really wanted each character to kind of stand out color wise especially since the movie was going to be at night and that's why sam and josh are orange and yellow because i didn't want them to get uh you know we were going to shoot kind of a, a, a darker film foggy I wanted to make sure that they could um, be seen and not get like washed out. Um, and I wanted each one of them to have their own kind of uh, color palette too. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Chris is like white and red. Josh is, you know, yellow and Sam is uh, orange. Michelle uh, doing, having the purple dress with the pink and all that. So we really thought it out, you know, um, trying to, for, as far as locations in the movies and stuff like that. But the majority of uh, the rest of it, as far as location wise was sets that we built like in a, a, a big pole barn, um, you know, for the, the actual barn itself mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, the hoot, the hoot nanny. Um, but I tell people like the, the way the movie looks old and feels old um, is just the way I think we lit it. You know, we, mm -hmm. we really studied uh, a lot of the eighties films and kind of what we wanted to try to make it look like uh, without overlighting things, um, making sure we did, you know, shadows here and, uh, especially the colors, you know, we, we, we called different houses when they were trick or treating, like, Oh, this is the carpenter house. This is the Argento house. You know, um, this is the trick or treat house. So, uh, I think everybody there kind of understood the kind of movie we were making and they, it, and they, they knew it wasn't like a modern day horror film. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it was nice. It wasn't just me, you know, it was, it was a team of people that could, could put their input into something and, and make it look that way. Yeah, yeah, and I like I like how <clears throat> like you said there the Burmax. It feel what it feels like, and I don't. I, I'm not. I think I might have read that this was the case, but it feels like a film that was made in the '80s, not released, just kind of put away in a can, and then someone's just discovered it in 2016, yeah, and played the reel because the, the burn. There's some scenes where the burn marks make it look as though you know the the, the kind of it's it's deteriorated over time, but that just works. Was that was that kind of what you were going for with the feel of yeah. the, the look? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I I wanted it to feel like a, a lost drive-in movie uh, that never got a proper transfer. You know, it never made its way to VHS or DVD. So you're you're watching that film reel converted, uh, and then that I mean that's why if you if you compare one and two, uh, number one looks more heavily grained with the burns, the shake. When you get to two, I can I, I tell people but number two is more like watching a full moon VHS rental of the 90s. A uh, little bit less grain, brighter lighting, uh, no, you know, no burn marks and things like that. Um, but I wanted you to feel like they, they both came out of two different decades and maybe two different uh, you know formats of, of how the movie was made or how it was maybe found, you know, mm -hmm. and how you're just kind of discovering it at the time. Uh, yet again, um, uh, a lot of that stuff happens in post-production with the, the way the movie looks, but it all starts when we're shooting it too, the way we light it. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes across awesome. Um, like, and you could tell it what I feel as well is like you were saying there about the difference. One feels like an eighties movie and one does feel like a nineties movie, even the way it, it's shot and lit. So that it does come across as if it's two very different decades and that, that does come across really well. Um, both mm. films though are, very gory and uh, all practical effects, which is fantastic. Obviously, there's certain things that you can't have practical, like uh, mm. Hello Jack's eyes. You know, he needs to have that kind of in post. But everything else, from what I could gather, it looked completely practical. Yeah. It's on screen. Um, so, and even on this in the second film, the gore, the kills, it, the ante's upped. So, was that always your? kind of if you were going to make a horror film you just wanted to make it as gory as possible and on screen was that kind of like a a no negotiation stipulation for you yeah um i, I mean for the first movie i wanted to uh, you know if, if you watch the the extended cut there's more of a story to it um and i wanted the first movie to be more story driven than gore uh but then after we did about a year of touring i tried to get feedback from people and they were 
it, it was kind of 50 50. It was some people liked that it was character driven and other people just wanted it to get straight to uh, the goods. You know, they wanted people to get killed. They wanted to see the action. So when we released the Blu-ray that we cut the movie down like 16, 17 minutes. Now we, we put parts of it on the bonus features, um, but it's a much fast, more faster paced cut. Um, so you see, you're seeing a lot more action happening than, you know, than it being spaced out with dialogue and things happening for the sequel. I was just like, I, I think this is what people liked. So I'm just going to get into the action after we get a little bit of story told. And then, uh, you know, you always amp it up for, you know, the next story anyway. So it's, you know, it's more blood, more boobs, more gore, uh, more monsters. So um, I, with this one, we kind of, and we shot it during the pandemic. Mm. So we basically were just sitting there going, what, what can we do and how can we kill these people uh, since we have this studio space uh, to do this in, you know? And so there was a few times when we shot, uh, we'd shoot a scene and we'd shoot it months apart and we'd put it together and we'd start watching the movie and we'd go, oh man, this one we shot back here does not look as cool as this most recent one. We should go back and fix that now. And uh, not to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't watched it, but there is one particular scene with a girl in a hallway with, with, a, with a bird man. Um, oh, she yeah. didn't, she did not get c killed as cool, uh, as that, uh, originally. And it was the last, sh it was the last kill we did in the movie. And I said, let's, let's go back and let's fix that one. Cause we did that so long ago. And then we went back and we did the one that's in the movie, which everybody loves. And, uh, it won best kill at a, a film fest in, in Canada recently. Um, but it seems to be like everyone's favorite kill. And it was the last one we yeah. shot, like probably in June of just this past year. Yeah, that's funny you should say that, actually. I did an episode on the band part two a month or two ago now, um, and uh, I did say that that, that was my favourite kill, uh, the Birdman kill in the in the hallway. I just thought it was yeah. awesome. It was just fantastic. Awesome yeah. to do. Um, now, um, now, before we get into the band part two, I wanted yeah. to touch on Scream Team releasing. Um, sure. So how did Scream Team releasing come about? Because... Uh, it's a phenomenal place for indie mm -hmm. horror. Like it's the home of indie horror. Um, it's just got ri a ridiculous amount of titles on there. It's obviously mm -hmm. where the barn merchandise stories. Um, mm -hmm. So how did Scream Team releasing come about? Yeah. So Scream Team started because of the barn. Uh, I never signed with a distribution company uh, because I was in that, I was in that situation of um, I, I can't make an exposure deal for this movie. I have to make a deal that brings me back that money to not lose my house. <laughs> so yeah, back to that again. Um, so I spent probably the better part of a year just going through distributors and, and kind of grilling them and being like, well, you know, what's going to be my return. You know, I've done all this, I've done all this work. The you know, movie's been through a hundred film fests. It's won like 70 awards. Uh, it's played all over the country. All, all, I mean, all over the world. Um, I have all this merchandise, you know, you, you pretty much I've sold the movie for you already. So what, what are you going to do for me in return? Um, and a lot of people, they they couldn't give me answers. Uh, and then the people that could give me answers, it was very low. It was like, oh, maybe maybe within the first five or seven years after sales are recouped and everything, you might see two or $3,000. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's nothing. You know, <laughs> uh, I, was like, I was like, wow. Um, so I finally told my wife, I said, I think the best bet is for me to just sell this movie on my own because uh, mm -hmm. no one is going to push it as hard as me. So there I was again, uh, going to conventions and selling the movie, you know, uh, but I told people the story, you know, a, a very shortened ver version of like, this movie was a nightmare, but it was a dream for me to make as a kid. And after all the struggles, it's finally been made. And, you know, and a lot of people were like, wow, that's, that's crazy. I want to buy a copy. Um, so that was like my sales pitch. Um, mm -hmm. And we sold thousands of movies to the point that I started um, meeting a lot of other filmmakers. And they were like, look at your setup. Like you have all this merchandise for this movie. And that's kind of what made me stand out and, and nothing against other filmmakers, but that, you know, that's what made me stand out at, at these shows from filmmakers near me where they just had uh, burn, you know, burned looking discs, mm -hmm. no, good looking cover art the back didn't look like it looked like they just typed in word or something you know um and then you would come over to our table and we had this plethora of merchandise 
So people would kind of look at us like, oh, you must be something already or have somebody behind you. And it wasn't, it was just me and my wife. Uh, so other filmmaker would come to me and they'd be like, they'd go, Hey, we would, you know, would you like to sell my movie? Would you do that for me? And I'm like, I'm not a distributor. Uh, and I, you know, obviously because distributors are terrible people, they steal your money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after about another six or seven months of selling the movie, uh, I started going around to the same places again. And I started noticing that everybody that was coming to these shows already had it. And they're like, oh, yeah, I already got the barn. It's awesome. And I'm like, damn it. Like, how am I going to how am I going to pay this table cost off now? Because, you know, no one's buying as much. Well, I did this movie called 1031. Uh, mm -hmm. I, did a, I did a segment in it with uh, the composer from the barn, Rocky Gray. And uh, he was going to do the exact same thing as me. He was just going to sell his movie on his own. Well, he did it for a few months and he contacted me. And he said, this is really hard and I don't have the time to go to the shows like you do, would you mind selling the movie at your table and taking a cut? And it was like the same thing that everybody else has asked me. And I was hesitant, but I was like, well, I'm friends with Rocky and I did a segment in this movie. Mm -hmm. So technically I, I guess it was that bad because I can say, Hey, if you enjoyed the barn, you might enjoy this movie because I was a part of it too. So I did that and I started seeing income come back more and more and my wife was like hey this is this is pretty good you know and i was selling his movie a lot so in in return to that i would see the same filmmakers again and they go hey you're selling somebody's movie at your table now you told me you wouldn't do that and i was like ah well you know uh, let me explain the situation but i started thinking one night i said you know i didn't sign with anybody because of my fear of my movie basically being stolen for 10 to 15 years uh, never seeing a penny because I heard all of the horror stories from all of my other filmmaker friends. Uh, I said, maybe I can give that opportunity to somebody else, you know? And um, so a group of myself and some other people got together and we started screen team releasing. Now I tell filmmakers all the time, like, and this is, this is not a sales pitch, but it's more of a, just a, a filmmaker to filmmaker. I, you know, we are business Obviously, if your movie looks good, we'd like to have your movie because we can sell it and it'll make us money. But at the end of the at the end of the day, if you're in a situation like I was in with the barn, you know, we have titles. There's only so much that we can do per title because a new title comes out. So, you know, there's marketing and all that stuff. Um, nobody can push or hustle the movie, your own movie, harder than you. So as much as I would love to have your movie and make make money off your movie i would rather see you take your film and go make the money and you know change your life um and so i've passed on a lot of movies and i've, I've turned some filmmakers away that have gone on to make good money themselves just because i i would rather i, and I would tell them too like hey be careful where, what you do you know but you have an opportunity here to make good money if you just do it yourself mm -hmm. So that's kind of been the scream scream team thing here is, uh, you know, it's every filmmaker we've brought on. Uh, we try to be like a family of, uh, you know, a team here. So I've got filmmakers in different cities that will run tables for us, uh, you know, in Chicago or um, Ohio or New Jersey or Florida, you know, it just, or California. It just, it just depends on where they're located. Um, but it's nice because then they get to represent and sell their films, tell their stories, make their money inter interact, make connections with their fan base. Uh, and it's not just a distributor that, you know, here's my face. You're seeing it. I'm not, I'm not hiding, you know, you can find me, uh, you know, yeah. I'm active. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, and I would never have, I would never have started this business and got into this business if I intended on um, deceiving or screwing over people, you know, cause that's exactly what I tried to avoid. So it, it, we're in, I think year, uh, we're almost into year seven now uh, for Scream Team. So uh, the pandemic almost took us down, but <laughs> we came we came right back. So it was good. That's awesome. Uh, but, uh, and it, 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 it's been good. Awesome. And the website's just had a revamp as well. I've, I've, well, not recently, like in the last six months or so, was it? It's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real, it's yeah. real, really clean looking now and looks awesome. Um, yeah. So do you have any uh, favorite movies that you sell on Scream Team that – isn't your own. Uh, that's oh yeah. Um, I think anybody who knows me, so I, I'm, I don't pick, I try not to pick favorites. Cause I, I do, you know, we all kind of as a team look at the films and, you know, uh, 
you know, the films vary. They vary from budget to story to all that, but there's always something redeeming about it why we pick them up. Uh, but I love The Sleeper. Uh, the Sleeper was the film that when I was doubting myself to make a retro movie in 2013, I had people I was talking to and I said, I want the barn to take place in the 80s. And they were like, don't do that. You know, just make it today. And I said, this story isn't a today movie. You know, I said, this is the kind of story where the kids, you know, they would have been like on bicycles in my original story. But I said, like a Stranger Things type thing. I said, you know, it's the style of music. It's the style of clothing. You know, it's uh, it's the look of the film that I want. I said, I couldn't uh, I couldn't do that today without, uh, you know, in, in the 2000 in the 2000s. And um, I saw the ad for the sleeper in Fangoria magazine. And I was like, what is this? And uh, it was a throwback. Now, he did a trailer that looked like the barn how it was damaged and all that, but the film didn't look like that. He cleaned it up. And I later found out he cleaned it up because people did the same thing to him where they were like, don't do that. Don't make the whole movie look like that. Um, and I, I told him, I said, I wish you would have done that because I loved, I loved the way the trailer was, but I still love the movie. Um, but I thought Justin Russell did a great job uh, making his own 1980s uh, slasher film that it's very much like black Christmas and girls night out. Um, and prom night, but I just, I, I, I didn't know him at the time, but I was just like, man, if I could find this guy, I would hire him to make the barn. And I, I searched and searched and searched for him and I could not find him because he wasn't on social media. So I eventually had to find other people. And when the funny thing is, is that when I started scream team, he was the deciding factor for me to make it a go of a business. Um, through a mutual friend, I did not know. I, I shared a picture of the sleeper and then someone contacted me and said, Hey, I know his wife. And I said, you know, Justin Russell's wife. He said, yeah. He goes, uh, they used to live in Ohio, but now they live in Oregon. I said, can you put me in contact with him? So I got in contact and we had like a two hour conversation where I told him what I was doing. We were starting this business. This, my, my friends and I, we were starting this company. I said, I'm a huge fan. Um, I said, I don't know if you ever sold the rights to your movie on Blu-ray. And he said, in fact, he had never sold his rights at all. He had only manufactured the discs himself. He did the marketing himself. And he said it was like a complete failure. Uh, and it, it made him not want to make movies ever again. And I said, well, dude, I'm a huge fan. And I said, I will give this like the Scream Factory release uh, for you if you give me the rights. And he was like, hey, you know, after talking to you for this amount of time, he's like, it's just sitting on a hard drive and it's been there for years. He's like, so how about I just mail you the hard drive and you do what you want with it? So um that's when i was like okay now that i have the sleeper i'll i'll we can start looking at whatever we want because now this is like the title that i had always dreamed about uh in a sense of putting on blu-ray or like seeing it on blu-ray and now i was putting it on blu-ray but making that relationship with justin was awesome because other indie filmmakers were like you got the sleeper how did you get the sleeper that dude you know that dude's like gone like he he disappeared <laughs> i was like yeah i got the sleeper um <laughs> but it's it, it is um it, just knowing that he went through troubles too and, you know, and, and everything, there was a lot to relate, but it, um, as far as all the titles go, that's, that's the one for me. I think it's because it was like the first one that like I, I went out and I found, and I was like, this is the one I want. And I made that deal. Yeah. But, uh, but I was such a huge fan because I'd seen it first, you know, years before I had seen it and it inspired me. So it was cool to work with being able to work with him now. That's awesome. Oh, would you yeah. ever consider like turning it into a, like a streaming platform or is it physical media? Is that kind of, you know, what you're looking at? Uh, you know, things always change. I mean, right now, physical still doing really well, but uh, which is surprising. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been in talks about how we can, you know, continue as times, you know, continue, I should say. Um, so there is, there is things we're looking there. There are options for that, that we are looking into like screen team streaming, you know, or stream team. Stream, like oh, there you go. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, stream, stream. Yeah. 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 So there's all kinds of fun stuff there. But yeah. Yeah. It's um right now we're just right. We have so many awesome titles that are going to be coming out this year that we're getting ready to do. So it's just, it's just a big year uh, because of the barn, the barn, barn part two opened up a lot of doors for us. So we were able to get a, a large budget for our acquisitions this year. 
So we have a lot of cool titles coming up from Scream Team coming up. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great segue. Let's let's get into the barn yeah. part two, which yeah. came out uh, aptly on uh, Halloween 2022. Uh, I got my copy again, just to show people right there. Got my copy of the barn part two. Mine, you, shipping was really quick on this thing because it was released, I think, on the... Uh, Halloween, I did my pre-order through Scream Team, and it literally arrived like the first week of November here in the UK. And our oh, postage wow. is terrible. Like, our postage yeah. is always on strike. And <laughs> it arrived so quickly. And uh, yeah, so Barn Part 2, love it. It's a great, great flick. Everyone should go out and buy the Barn Part 2 from Scream Team releasing. So how did you come up with kind of, what made you want to make the Barn Part 2? So you've released... 2016, The Barn, and then, you know, a bit of time has passed, and then you go into The Barn Part 2. So was that just a, a natural progression, thinking how you were always going to do The Barn Part 2? or No, no. Um, it, it was that situation of everybody kept asking for it. I said, I will go ahead and I'll, I'll do a fundraiser, and uh, if you pay for it, then I'll make the movie. Uh, and then they they paid for it. <laughs> I found myself in a situation where I had to make a movie. Um, and, and I was excited to, but I honestly did not think that they would, that they would pay for, it, you know, that people would come together and pay for it. Um, the, the thing that sucked about that situation was, is that um, we got the money and then we started looking at locations of how to shoot the movie. So number one, we shot the original movie of a majority of it. Like I said, in a pole barn, and we shot that in the countryside. So it was just a big steel building. That building, as it got closer to fall and then into winter, uh, it could be like negative 10 degrees inside that building because it didn't hold any kind of heat or anything. And there was no ceiling. Uh, and then when it got into summer, it could be like 110 degrees in there because it just held all the heat. So like it was just it was the worst environment. You were either freezing or you were sweating. So we said, you know, if we're going to do this this time, we need to do we need to make our own production building for this because now's the time to do it moving forward with with more films. So we spent the first probably six or seven months of that first year building a sound stage to have ready for the movie. And I mean, it was people were flying in for the Indiegogo shoots. Uh, Linnea and uh, Linnea Quigley was here. Ari Lehman was here. I don't even think that there was time for, for most of us to sleep leading up to that because we were literally hanging drywall, painting walls, building sets. And it was like the next day they were coming and we still weren't finished. Um, and it was a, it was a huge massive scene that takes place in the movie with uh, zombies and the street crowd and all this stuff. And people were like, you're crazy to do this first as the first scene in the movie. And I said, I just want to get it out of the way. I just want to know that the Indiegogo people are done and I've got Linnea and Ari wrapped and I don't have to worry about it. Um, so we shot that and we, we shot the stuff with uh, Lloyd Kaufman, like all in a stretch. And then we took a break because we were like, we felt like we were dying after months <laughs> of building, after like uh, almost every day after work and other people were coming after work and, you know, the, when we're done shipping stuff and all that, doing the screen team stuff. Um, we need a break. I said, let's just take the, take the holidays off. We'll come back beginning of 2000, um, I guess it would have been 2019 or 2020. I can't remember now. It's been so many years. The next year. Uh, so we were going to build a video store set. And I ended up coming across a guy or a page on Instagram called Nostalgia Video. And there's an individual who has this video store in his basement. And it's, it's not open to the public, but it's just a really cool setup. And he changes the movies all the time. So I reached out to him. And I told him, I said, is there any way, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of your page. I said, is there any way we could shoot a movie in your business? And he said, it's not a real business, you know, sorry. I said, oh, that sucks because I, I made a movie called The Barn and I'm making a sequel to it. And he was like, I love The Barn. And he was like, absolutely. You could, and he, had a, he actually had a VHS. He sent me a picture of the VHS. And he's like, you could come here and film. So we went up in February uh, and it was the beginning of a three week block where we were gonna shoot the rest of the movie. We went up there, we shot that scene and uh, the following weekend was when the three week block was going to start two days after that 
video store scene is when the pandemic happened and oh. like the, and the world shut down and we didn't film again for eight months. Um, and so that just messed up everything for the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So how was that as well? Because, you know, eight months later, we're still in the pandemic. You know, it's yeah, still... Yeah. Little did we know in March 2020 that nearly two years later, we would have still been in the shit. Um, so yeah, yeah. how was that working during COVID? Um, stressful because uh, we finally just got to a point where we were like, how much longer are we going to, are we going to wait or can we wait? You know, we, we thought, Oh, it's going to be a month or two. This will be back to normal. And then three months, four months, five months. And we're just sitting here and we have these set, sets built that that was the street set was built. And we're like, we can't even build new sets until we finish like the inserts that were do, left on this street set, but we don't have the other people here. Like, when we did the stuff with the Indiegogo, we did um, everything that was important that had to get shot with the people. And then we were going to bring in the other people that were like local and things like that. Well, nobody wanted to get together. Nobody wanted to be in the mm -hmm. same room together because you didn't know if you were how you, you going to die. You know, you just didn't know anything about how it was working. So we were just kind of at a standstill and we're like, is this movie ever going to get finished? Because now I had people that were local people that were in New York, people that were just a state or two away that could drive here. But then they decided that they needed to go back to wherever their families lived. So now they were hours and hours away and everybody kind of spread out. So instead of it being like, Oh, somebody could travel here in a couple hours or within a day. Now it's like, Oh, we have to book them planes to get back. Um, so there's costs we didn't think about now. Um, some people, you know, if, if people knew each other, there'd be two or three people in a hotel room, especially if there were girls, like if they all knew each other now it was like, Oh, some of these hotel rooms for the most part can only have one person in it. So the, the hotel went budget went crazy. Uh, you know, we had to do masks and gloves and, you know, mm. um, sanitizer, and because, you, you know, we constantly had like one person on set that was just going behind everybody and like cleaning doorknobs and just it was, <laughs> it was crazy because you just you wanted to make sure because like the, the biggest thing was at the time was you we are doing something in the middle of this pandemic and we don't want to get somebody sick for a movie, you know, yeah. so we wanted to make it and there was no COVID testing at the time. So, you know, and everybody's like, uh, if you feel if you're good, like beforehand, you can come. But we're just like temperature checking temples and things like that. Um, it was just, it was just more stress on top of it <laughs> than it yeah. normally is on a, on, a, on a movie set, especially for an indie set too. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. Every, every, every minute is a dollar or something, you know? And <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's insane. God, I still have PTSD yeah. about that time. It was just, uh, I work for the NHS in my day to day job, which is the kind of the hospital here. And, uh, you know, and it was, Oh my, it was, it was, it was hell. It was awful. Um, but anyway, um, so in both The Barn and The Barn Part 2, you've got some incredible horror alumni, as you've just alluded to there. You've got Linnea Quigley, Nari Lehman in the first film, the first Jason, Doug Bradley in the second film, yeah. uh, Uncle Lloyd is in the second film, uh, you know, Drew Marvick is in the second film. Um, he's kind of like, again, he's one of the kings of indie horror at the moment. Uh, Joe Bob Briggs. So how did you get these guys on board? I suppose that's two questions, because I'd imagine that the story of getting Linnea and Ari involved was very different to getting kind of everyone involved in part two. Yeah. I mean, Linnea and Ari was, uh, it was a lot easier uh, just because the first one wrapped, you know, it had wrapped, it was successful. We had talked, if there was going to be a sequel, would you come back? And they said, absolutely. So that was kind of already established. Um, I had a producer come in to help us and he knew Lloyd Kaufman. So he was the key to getting Lloyd in and, and coming in for that weekend. So that was, that was pretty simple too. Uh, as far as Joe Bob, uh, Diana Prince and Doug Bradley, and then Drew, I'll get to Drew. Um, <laughs> I know, I know Drew, he's a friend. So that was, that was pretty easy too. But uh, Doug Bradley, I, I come to find out he lives in Pittsburgh, which is about 40 minutes away from me. I didn't know that at the time. Um, I, I wrote the scene in the movie um, for an older actor. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted it to be, I, I had a list of actors I was going to reach out to. He was at the top 
and I didn't think that I could get him. I just because I, I didn't think I didn't know he lived here, honestly. So I just thought budget wise, how am I going to fly him here? You know, what's a, what's his day rate and all you know per diem, all that stuff. But I thought, what what the hell? I'll just reach out. So I wrote this big email directly to him, and he responded and he said, yeah. He said, sure, I'm interested. Send it to me. So I sent him the script and I explained to him. I said, this is you know, it's a slasher film. It's a sequel. I said, but this is not a throwaway character. And in fact, if I can't get you to, to do this story, I may just cut the scene from the movie. I said, because I really want somebody, because Doug Bradley does these things on, on YouTube called Spine Chillers. He tells yeah. these stories. He's, he's really, really good. And I knew whoever did the storytelling needed to be a, a, a very good storyteller. Um, but there's just something about him. So I really, really wanted him to do that. And, and the, the part of the movie kind of ties in part one with how Sam's family has, is involved a little bit. And uh, it gets back into the mythology more because everybody seemed to like the, the mythology of the first movie about where these creatures came from. So it gives you more of an origin. Um, but after I sent the script to Doug, he came back to me and he's like, I'd love to do it. He's like, I think this would be something really fun to be a part of. I love the story. So then I talked to his agent, we worked out all that stuff. And then that's when I found out, wow, he's actually in Pittsburgh. So he could just drive to set within like an hour and a half, do the scene and then drive back home in an hour and a half. So uh, talking to him on set, he said, you know, honestly, once you told me where you were located and I looked at the script, he goes, I took that all into account because at the time it was the pandemic, nothing was happening. So there was no conventions, you know, uh, you know, he, he said, and this is a nice way of him putting it right time, you know, right place, yeah. which I, I kind of say, so if I would have reached out to him now, <laughs> he'd probably <laughs> say no because he's got stuff to do. Uh, but he wasn't doing anything at the time, you know? So it was a, it was a way to make money. I, I, I look at it that way, um, but, but he was, he was great. Uh, and probably the, the one actor that I worked with that I was most intimidated with because I'm like, you know, this is Doug Bradley pinhead, but man, um, he he is super serious when he wants to be, and not in a bad way. It's just he got there and he was in character, and he he knew how the this this character had got up that morning and what he drank, what he ate, how he was going to take his glasses off, and you know he asked me a lot of questions that none of the other people did. So it was like, oh okay, oh you taking this, <laughs> you taking this for real, you know? Uh, um, amazing guy. Um, as far as Joe Bob Briggs, uh, Joe Bob is actually in that movie, The Sleeper. He plays a doctor. So when I picked up that movie, I went to a convention in 2018 uh, with Scream Team. It was the first year we had the sleeper and I brought it up to him and I was I just because I'm a fanboy for sleeper. So I had rep replica. I don't even have know where it is right now. I have replica hammers made because the killer in the sleeper holds a hammer. He kills people with a hammer. I had the hammer replicated so that you could get it all signed by the cast. And I wanted to get Joe Bob to sign it. So I went up to him and I told him, I was like, Hey, I got this, you know, I put this movie out and he was really confused because my name is Justin. The filmmaker is named Justin. Um, <laughs> and I was asking him, I was like, I'm a big fan. Will you sign my stuff? And he was like, are, are you Justin? Cause you don't look like Justin. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm a different Justin, but I'm a fan. And, you know, so we got to talking and I said, I would love to have you in a movie called cryptids uh, where you play a radio uh, DJ host. And I just gave him a, a little rundown. He started getting busy, but he said, talk to my, my assistant here. She'll get you the information. So I got the information and it probably wasn't more than a month or so after that, uh, the whole shutter series came out and he just blew up. I mean, he was everywhere. He was pretty much un untouchable. I could not pin him down. Uh, every time I reached out, they were like, he's busy, you know, but he's still interested. We just don't know when he'll be available. Uh, it wasn't until uh, I think June of the pandemic, his team reached out to me and they were like, Hey, do you still want to make this movie? And I was like, um, yeah, when? And they were like, well, John is free right now. Cause there's nothing happening with the world, you know, <laughs> and he wants to know if you want to film it. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. But I can't get a person to get in a room with me, <laughs> you know, and I need a whole crew. And uh, so I told him, I was like, let me get right back to you. So I talked to the team and I said, look, you know, Joe, Bob, John, I said, he's willing to, to be in this movie. I said, but the radio station we had booked will not let people in. 
I said, so we don't have a radio station. I said, and we need at least four, four of the, four of the 10 crew members to come and be a part of this. So I was able to get at least four people to come to be crew. And then we had to build an entire radio station in our sound stage uh, within like a month. So I told them, I was like, this is going to be really difficult to do, but I, I, I'll make it work if, you know, if, if he can still accommodate the time frame. I said, but is there any chance that while he's here this weekend, if I can get done quick enough that we'll walk from the cryptid set over to the barn two set and he'll do a cameo for that. And they were like, Oh yeah. He said, absolutely. I was like, great. So, <laughs> so I made sure that we got the uh, cryptids scene done. And then we just switched his wardrobe and went right over and did the uh, drive-in scene for the barn two. Uh, he had such a good time here with us talking to me, talking to him about filmmaking, about the problem, you know, just my experience with the barn and how it turned into a success story that, a couple months later, he called me up and he invited me to be a guest speaker at his Joe Bob's Jamboree uh, at the Mah Mahoney Drive-In. So he brought me up, put me in a hotel. I did, I did this whole this whole kind of like seminar thing. Uh, and at the end, uh, I got to meet Diana and she was like, oh, Joe Bob's talked so much about you. He's talked about the barn, how much he loves it. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing the sequel right now. I was like, and we have like one more big scene. If you want to be a part of it, I'd love to get you in. She's like, I'd love to. So I thought like, I didn't know if she was bullshitting me or not. You know, like <laughs> she just being friendly. Cause you know, she's in front of people, but no, I mean, she, she followed up and she came out in October and it was the last big scene for the movie that we shot. Um, so I, I tell people, I'm like, you know, as much as, you know, the uh, overall, obviously the pandemic was, I've absolutely terrible for the world uh, for many, many filmmakers in the same boat as me, you know, it, it destroyed a lot of things and I didn't know how I was going to come back from it, but man, in, in, in some degree, the setbacks, it, it, it made, it opened up so many doors for me because yeah. if I would have been on time with the movie, because the movie got pushed back by like two years, yeah. if I would have been on time, uh, I wouldn't have had Doug Bradley. I wouldn't have had Joe Bob. I wouldn't have, Di I wouldn't have had Diana. Uh, and I honestly don't think we would have had all the cool kills and some of the, the awesome stuff that makes the movie so much fun. If we wouldn't have had the, the time to go and be like, well, we're still waiting. Let's, let's go do this again. You know? Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, we found positive in, a, in such a bad thing, but as far as drew Marvick, I've known him for years being a fan of pool party massacre. Yeah. And, uh, I've done the convention circuit with him a lot. And I told him, I said, I want to bring you out. I want to bring your son out and I want you to be in this movie and I want you to be, a a, boy scout troop leader and he was like absolutely so uh he came out and i think it was november of the of 2021 i want to say or maybe 2020 so it was sometime during the pandemic as well um but him and his son were great great to work with uh his son is the one spoiler uh his, his son is the one who falls into the fire <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it was cool because it, it was cool seeing a, a, a father and son work together on screen. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd never met his son before and his son had done films with him already. So we had two other kids that had never really done anything. And it was, it was really cool watching his son kind of, you know, boost the other kids confidence and be like, no, you don't have to be afraid, you know, just, uh, just do this, you know? So it, it was really cool. That's awesome. Drew's awesome. I mean, I, he, he was at a <clears throat> convention here in the UK in October, but he wasn't there as a guest. He was just there. Like, oh, okay. he, he wasn't like announced. And then I, I got to, uh, I was in the, the hotel in the morning, having breakfast. And I turned, I was like, that's Drew Marvin. Like, <laughs> what's he doing here? I was like, so I just went over to him and said, I'll, I'll he's, also call he's, he's everywhere. He's, he's, he's famous, everywhere. He's famous for being Drew. He's made it his, uh, that's his whole brand now is him, you know? Yeah. His, his like, Instagram like, is hilarious. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, and it, do, if you follow his Instagram, do you see the head with him all the time? Uh, he he always has the decapitated head from oh, the movie. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's he's that's got, the head. He's, he, he's like early morning shorts that he puts on. It's just, yeah. You know, you just put it on him. You know, just flicking through in the morning, just see him. You're like, that's oh, fantastic. Right yeah, today. Yeah. <laughs> like I wave pool party massacre too. So hopefully that's going to be uh, not too long. Yeah. Um. So I was going to ask actually. You've touched on it there in a little bit with um. Drew's son and what mm. happens at the start of the band part two. And it also yeah. happens at the start of the band part one. And the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something yeah. that I actually totally admire. Um, and it's not something that you're getting a lot of 
slasher yeah. films, which is surprising. Um, and that's kids getting killed. Yeah. Um, it, have you had any pushback on that? And because that that's like a, a bit of a, ta- a taboo in some places, isn't it? But no, you... I actually, it's great balls to the wall. Like, just do it, man. So, how was that approach? Like, getting no, yeah, you know, I was wondering when someone was going to ask me, like, do you like watching kids get murdered? I'm like, no, no, I love kids, but I... <laughs> no, you know, I in, in the first movie, I wanted to do something that when you sit down and you watch it, you go like, oh shit, they they kill a kid. Like, anything's possible now. You know, especially when we do stuff towards the end with like Cannibal Holocaust, you know, with with Nikki on the pole and all that. Um, But in the sequel, uh, it it had nothing really to wanting to kill kids as much as it. I wanted it to be a campfire story uh, with Boy Scouts, you know, and I'm like, I can't. You got to come out with a bang. You know, I'm like, I can't let these kids get away because then they run and tell that these things were here and it messes up the rest of the movie. So I have to kill these kids. (laughs) Plus, you want to see it. Uh, but no, no one's come at me and been like, hey, why would you kill these kids? Now, the thing, I don't know how it is over there, but I'm i am certain that if I killed a dog or a cat in the beginning of the movie, I would be ripped apart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, that's just, so, I mean, I can try it in the next one and see what happens. But uh, so far, people have been like, oh, wow, they killed a kid. And that's kind of cool. But I, I, I'm pretty sure if I killed an animal, I'd be like, no, you don't do that. So. It's so strange, isn't it? It's so strange that kind of thing. Like yeah. you can get like a little girl and put a pickaxe in her head, <laughs> but touch a dog. Oh well, no, yeah. no, no, no. Which I, I, I've done so many of the screenings of that, which is fun, which is great. It's like a midnight movie, almost like a Rocky Horror Picture Show type thing, where when that would happen and that pickaxe would hit the head, you just hear these people in the crowd be like, "Yeah!" <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I mean. I'm glad that's. I'm glad it's a positive response, but it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, and as you say, it yeah. sets it up because it's like, right, anything could happen now. Like, yeah, could, yeah. anyone, anyone could die. And yeah, it just sets the tone perfectly. It's yeah. Awesome. Um, now, I did want to. I did want to ask you about the Bound Part Two and the story of the Bound Part Two. And I might have read this a bit wrong, but uh-huh. was the story changed from your original concept because? I think in the original concept, it was like about the Devil's Railroad. It was the barn part two, the Devil's Railroad. And um, obviously, we see the Devil's Railroad in the barn part two as like a part of the haunt. So was that like a change in direction or was that? Oh, um, Zombie Railroad. Zombie Railroad, sorry. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So um, the original storybook was called Zombie Railroad. And it was about Sam, Chris, and Josh because Chris lived. And uh, it's about them in their town they've already defeated the monsters from the previous halloween and now like i said this is kids this is a kid's storybook so it's you know it doesn't make much sense because i wrote it when i was like 10. (laughs) um some somewhere along the story they're digging this big hole in the ground and they they come they come across and like a basically an underground type railroad track uh and down inside is all these dead people and when they get down in there, this gas or something releases and they all start coming back to life, like regenerate. Uh, and there's goblins and stuff. But then uh, the zombies end up marching back to the barn and then releasing the monsters and all this. Very much more goosebumps than, you know, even more so goosebumps than what I've made. Uh, but I, I knew that I could only take elements of that story and use it into a continuation because it just wouldn't have worked because it was... Uh, it was a standalone story from the first book that mm. I also, you know, strayed away from as well to make it an 80s, you know, updated like teen 80s slasher film. Uh, so uh, I tell people in the barn part two, it's hints of the original storybook, but it's much more like a um, a 1990s uh, college sequel, kind of like films like... Um, like a like a slaughterhouse rock or a fright night part two or even like a scream two has like that those elements of that in there uh type type vibe is what we yeah. were kind of going for like the, the feel and look to it with you know the girls in the sorority house and all that uh, and obviously it's all female led in this one yeah so what was the i was going to ask you about that what was the um <clears throat> the switch between obviously we have sam and josh in the first film yeah and we have heather and michelle as the main two in the second film so what was the reason for the switch was that always the plan was it scheduling or well it works either way because i must say 
Heather and uh, the Heather and Michelle characters are awesome in the second film and just as likable and just as fun as Sam and Josh in the first film. So you don't lose anything by going that way, but I was just interested to. Yeah. So, what so what happened was, is when the first movie wrapped the guy, the I'll, I'll say the, the guy, the actor who plays Josh, his name is Will Stout. He moved to New York and his career took off. Uh, he's been in a lot of shows. He's been in Daredevil on Netflix. He's been on a bunch of shows on CBS. He's been in some uh, horror films by the, the guy who made the Final Destination series. Um, he's on he's on a show right now on Netflix called Partner Track. Um, when he about I want to say about a year after the movie was released, we started talking about sequels. And um, he was like, I'm going to be honest with you. He's like, I don't know if I'm going to be in New York. If I'm going to be in L.A. He's like, things are taking off. He said, I'll do whatever I can to help you out because I like you. And, you know, and this was my first movie. He said, but please don't write anything that's going to be more than a cameo for me because I just I can't commit to it. So I knew from the right out the gate that I was going to have like a very small uh, window with Will. And I thought maybe it'd be like a weekend or two. And then re in reality, with the pandemic, it ended up being like five hours that I had with him. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, once I finally got him here. So I'm glad I didn't plan on him being in the movie long, like the way it worked out. Um, so the original story, the way when I started writing it was it was supposed to be Michelle is starts out with Michelle and she brings back Sam and Sam comes back early on. And it was a mission of finding Josh, trying to bring Josh back as well. Um, what happened was, is the actor who plays Sam uh, also probably right around three months before shooting, he contacted me and he was like, Hey man, I got a new job. Uh, you know, it's a career position. I don't know if I'm going to have the time to do a full blown movie. Is there any way you can make my part smaller? And I was like, how, how small are you talking? You know? And he's like, I don't know, like maybe like a cameo. I was like, I, I can't have both you guys be cameos. You know, <laughs> I said, you have to pop up in the movie at least like, halfway or two thirds through it. Like I can make it work, but yeah, you can't pop up like at the same time as him, you know? Yeah. And he was like, what he's like, whatever you can make work now for in the case of Mitch who plays Sam, I mean, he probably still filmed with us over the course of a year because of the pandemic. And he was probably here at least like, I don't know, 15 days. Um, but that did change things a uh, slightly. What I ended up doing was, is that it was Sam and Michelle, uh, Sam and Michelle were the leads. And then the side character was Heather, um, like, you know, like the buddy friend. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, I had to remove Sam, bring Heather up as the, the you know, the, the co-star and introduce Charlie as to replace Heather as like the third, the third wheel. Uh, and then when Sam enters the scene, that's when Heather leaves so that Sam can be in the story. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it, it was it was changing things around. Uh, and it's nobody's fault. You know, I don't blame them. It's life. You know, uh, it happens. It's just a matter of how you can fix it. But no, it was never. I, I tell people this too. any anybody who who sits there and goes, oh, man, I wonder what happened or why they didn't do Sam and Josh or, you know, why they didn't go this way. It was never in the cards for me to do a continuation of Sam and Josh uh, just just for actor purposes. You know, it was it, it just never happened. So yeah. that's really that, interesting. Yeah. yeah, and good to know actually as well. I think because I think uh, maybe there's a couple. I mean, I was I was a bit like, oh, I wonder what the story was there. So obviously, but it did like I say, it didn't take anything away from the yeah. film. The film was yeah. fantastic, and the duo. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I I would have to say the only complaint that I usually get from people when they do complain is that they wish there would have been more Sam and Josh, and I'm like, hey, I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, trust me, I, I I do too. But you know, I uh, I'm thankful that Lexi stepped up because. I like, and I tell people this too. Uh, it's weird because there are some people that watch the sequel and they go, um, I liked it. I think I like the, the original better. There's a charm to the, the first one that I, I can't really place, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really, uh, I really, really love the first one and I like the second one. Now I will do screenings and especially during this film fest tour where there was a lot of people that came out that have never seen the first movie. And after it was over, they were like, I loved this movie. They're like, now I have to see the original. And then they would contact me later and they're like, hey, I just want to let you know, I watched part one. I really liked it. 
but I still love part two better. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that I think it's what you've seen first yeah. um, is, is how you, how you, how you basically uh, noticed the barn or was introduced to the barn is kind of what is what set the tone for you, you know, and left that, that print on you for that. Uh, for most people now is what I'm starting to realize. Cause it seems like the newcomers are the ones who are like, I really, really love two and Oh, one was okay. And then the original people are like, I love one and two was okay. Or, or it's been like, I love both. So yeah. um, I looked at the movies making them is that I didn't want to make a carbon copy with part two. And if you'd never seen part one, and if you never wanted to watch part one, even after part two, there was a standalone movie. Basically it had two different vibes. This one was an 80s slasher lost film. This one was a 90s era VHS, you know, monster uh, slasher flick, which is just a monster mashup type thing in a haunted house, you know, just all kinds of killing, all kinds of chaos, all kinds of fun. Um, turn, your, turn your mind off for, you know, six minutes and just have fun. Um, and, and I think, you know, people were asking me about a part three and uh, there's, there, you know, there's obviously with the way, part two ended, I would love to continue, continue the trilogy and end it. Um, there are also situations with that, with, with, uh, cast members as well as like getting them back, trying to pick up the pieces, you know, how will we do it all? Especially with what I, you know, obviously with what you know about jo Josh and Sam and like, how, how could I ever do, uh, I think I listened to you, maybe it was yours where you were saying, I'm hoping that a barn part three, they're all together now. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah that would probably never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what, and that's what sucks. You know, that's the reality of it is that just, you know, because of individuals and their lives, I could probably never make that coordinate. Um, but we do have really cool ideas for part three to, to finish it out. That would work. It's just a matter of seeing now, do people want a part three? Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? Because I, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. And I'd love to finish the trilogy, which which would finish the story out. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So um, I was going before we kind of finish up on the barn part two, I wanted to ask about the uh, the barn baddies in the barn part two, because they look very different. They've had a redesign in the second one. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you touched on there your love of goosebumps and things like that. And <laughs> yeah. That actually kind of came to mind when I was watching it as well. But I also feel like that kind of, and I could be totally wrong here, but they feel like early 90s Goosebumps kind of Beetleborgs villains, which actually yeah. works really well for the the fact that it's set in the early 90s. Yeah, yeah. Was that the kind of feeling you were going for? What was kind of the inspiration oh, behind yeah. the freshening up of the of the characters? Yeah, exactly. Um, You know, we wanted to, my whole thing was is, growing up watching different slasher films, you know, every time there was a new nightmare on Elm street or Friday the 13th or a Halloween, depending on who the effects artist was, they did their own take on, you know, the killer. So Freddie's makeup changed. Uh, Michael Myers masks changed. Jason's mask changed, you know? So I wanted to stay kind of in that little trope there where, Oh, this is another, is a sequel. It's the same monsters, but their look has changed, but I wanted to give it a reason, you know, well, these guys were, damaged they were destroyed they've been pieced back together this is what they look like now but also giving a slight nod to that um when we got to the end and there's that creature at the end i told the effects artist i said i want this to look like something you would have saw uh the power rangers going after <laughs> you know because that you know obviously that was 90s and i remember just clicking through his channels and it seemed like there was always a show on that had some sort of big creature with a guy in a suit, you know, like that look like that, uh, like over the top type thing, you know, what, is it scary? No. Is it silly? Yeah. Is it fun? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's the whole point of it um, was to do something like that. Cause you know, the, I've always told people, I'm like, if you're going to watch the barn movies, you're not, they're not here to scare you. Uh, they're here to just have a good time. And then that element at the end is what we wanted to do was just have a, you know, this mashup at the end with one of those creatures was, was was something that we wanted to accomplish and but you're exactly right that's exactly what we were trying to do that's awesome and it, it yeah. nails it and i i'm a huge fan of goosebumps i'm a goosebumps <laughs> kid and uh i wasn't a big fan of the power rangers but i was a fan of the beetleborgs which was kind of like mm -hmm. the kind of knockoff power rangers <laughs> so yeah. well, like, those, those were cool too yeah yeah like flabber and stuff like that it was fantastic mm -hmm. uh 
Okay, so I've got one last question for you on the band, and then we'll we'll move on to cryptids uh, to end everything. But and this is a bit of a fun one. So if you were going to make a band part three, mm-hmm. what horror alumni would you want to cast as a special cameo that you haven't already had in the band part one and two? Is there anyone that you would just be a dream booking? Um, you know, one the, one of the people that I would like to talk because I think I have a really good role is Tom Matthews. Um, yeah, cause, and I, I, I don't want to say why, but, um, he's one of them. There's, there's actually a lot of people, um, but we don't, I should say we don't, I don't, we, uh, don't just put people can't, you know, in the movie just for like the sake of like, Hey, here's a name. Here's a cameo. Like to sh- just say they're in it. I try to find like legit reasons for a person to be in it and give them a character. That's like, Oh, th- I feel like they are that character that could be that character with like how we did Lloyd Kaufman as the town, the kooky town mayor or uh, Joe Bob as the, the owner of the drive-in uh, you know, or, or Diana playing one of the sorority girls. You know what I mean? Like, so I wanted it to feel natural. Um, mm-hmm. And we have people in mind for part three, but right now the, the one I will say is Tom Matthews is, is who I'd like to talk to. That would be awesome. And yeah. quite bookable as well. Tom is, you know, he's very, into yeah. indie horror and obviously never yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's in that final summer film i spoke to john iceberg last night who was he was the director of that film he's in there so oh, i cool. would imagine he would be very open to that and that would that would be awesome to see yeah um perfect so right i really appreciate your time and, and I'm, I'm aware that i've kept you for a while so just we'll finish on cryptids which is your yeah. new movie it's got an indiegogo campaign on right now so yeah. what can you tell us about uh, this project and, and where we are with it yeah so cryptids was supposed to be done last september <laughs> um did not get there we have two segments that are just about completed from uh two other filmmakers it's kind of been a little bit of a hold up here uh this month the movie should be done uh at least all of all of the stories together uh, so that this summer the movie will be out. Um, there's just a little bit of fine tuning and things like that. Uh, so I would say probably look for it to be available to purchase around September. Um, people who backed it will get it before then, but uh, definitely around September uh, on the Scream Team site it'll be available. But um, do you want me to talk about Cryptids? What it's yeah, about? Just, give it, like okay. just what, what people can expect and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Cryptids uh, stars Joe Bob Briggs. He is the host of a radio uh, radio show called The Truth Serum. And on this particular night, they are they've he selected the topic of cryptids, uh, and it's the day of the Mothman Festival in, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And so every caller that calls in has to have either an encounter or a story of an encounter with a creature. So that's, that's the wraparound basically. So anybody who calls and says, Hey, you know, uh, Harlan Dean, love your show. I'd like to tell you about this time that I encountered a Bigfoot and then it goes into the Bigfoot story. Um, so we have a plethora of, uh, of monsters. We have a Bigfoot, Mothman, uh, the Loveland Frogman, Chupacabras, uh, Hobskinville Goblins. I did a story um, that takes place in North Carolina called the Beast of Bladenboro. It's like a big vampiric uh, cat monster. We made this big animatronic beast. So uh, I'm trying to think if there was anything else there. Uh, any other monsters? There might be one more. That Oh, the Dover Demon. Um, so it's just, it's almost a two hour movie. We're trying to cut them down because we've got like the rough cuts and I keep it a little bit tighter. So it's not mm-hmm. super long, but it's, it's hard to do when there's about five directors and everybody's trying to tell a 15 to 20 minute story, you know, and, and then, and then you have Joe Bob's story as well. But so far, everything that's been that we've watched has come out really awesome. So I think people are going to dig it. There's a little bit of slasher elements, suspense, uh, comedy, you know, so there's never, I, I think, anybody who likes anthologies, there's going to be something there for everybody. And, and usually anthologies, there's usually one that's like, like a stinker. <laughs> I think we've done a pretty good job for this one. And there's, they're all pretty good. Awesome. Perfect. And people can still back that movie as well. The, the, is yeah. the Indiegogo campaign going to be live up until release? Do you think? Yeah, or... it'll be, it'll be live until release. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect. Well, um, I suppose just one, one last thing, uh, mm-hmm. Justin, really, are you going to be out in the convention world? 
uh, with the barn part two and with uh, yeah it's as well where can people see yeah, so we, in person? We, yeah we just started it uh we just did a uh, mad monster in north carolina last weekend uh coming up i know this doesn't help you at all because you're so far away but uh <laughs> coming up we have a uh, uh, horror realm in pittsburgh uh there's um monster mania uh there's a couple other ones in pennsylvania where, where we're located uh there's horror hound uh we're hoping to get into texas frightmare so if you check out the scream team site i, I don't know if they've updated it yet we usually have a, a tab for conventions where you can just meet us meet sometimes i'm there sometimes i'm not um but you can usually meet the filmmakers from some of the titles there uh, in person, get them to sign it, get whatever. Uh, I will be usually around the ones that are closer to Pennsylvania just because of the barn being out right now, mm -hmm. but you can also meet cast and crew at some of these shows too. So awesome. try to come out. Oh. Yeah. 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 Not, uh, well, not, actually most yeah. of our listeners and viewers are actually from America. I think the analytics okay. tell me about 70% of the listeners are in America, which is mental right. because I'm always sharing the podcast on UK pages. And it's, <laughs> it seems to be picked up in America. Uh, yeah. We have a, we, Coming to the UK, are you going to give us a showing of any of like cryptids or have you got any plans to, to uh, come over and do some stuff here? Not yet. If somebody uh, wants to hit me up and do a screening or something, let me know uh, for sure. Because uh, the goal is, is while cryptids is being finalized, manufactured, we'd like to do a, like a little film fest run. So if there's any uh, film fests over in the UK that are interested in screening it during the summer, you know, please feel free to contact us. Fantastic. Fingers yeah. crossed. That'll be awesome. Well, Justin, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, actually, one last thing. Where can people find you? Is it just the Scream Team social media and stuff like that? Have you got any socials that you'd like to plug? Uh, I mean, it's not me running it, but they can contact it. So uh, you can contact us at uh, there's Scream Team Releasing on Instagram, uh, Scream Team Releasing on Facebook. Uh, you can hit up ScreamTeamReleasing.com. If you want to find me, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no uh, you can't find me on facebook that's about the only place you'll find me and just justin m seaman uh i'm very selective don't take offense if i don't add you got a lot of family stuff on there so uh i get i get hit up with about you know 10 or 20 requests a day and i don't know who oh. these people are <laughs> who's who's staring at me and my kids in the swimming pools you know <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fair play. That's fair yeah. That was how I got. I just took a shot in the dark with the Scream Team email to contact you about this one, and it, it worked. So that was fantastic. Yeah. I was really lucky there. Well, <laughs> Justin, I really, really, really appreciate you coming on the podcast here. As I said at the top of the show, you are a bucket list guest for me to get. Oh on. yeah. Um, I've started to get guests on this year. I've been doing a podcast for a few years and started to get guests on, and you were like top of the list kind of people who I wanted to get on. I'm big fan uh -huh. of everything that you do and it's been well, a real you. real pleasure to uh to speak to you tonight i really yeah, appreciate awesome. it yeah no problem I, i've had a great time awesome well best of luck with cryptids um absolutely sure it'll be a massive success best of luck with the getting the barn part two everyone out there oh that green screen go and <laughs> buy the barn part two go and buy the barn go and check it out and uh yeah just absolutely best of luck with everything justin and once again thank you so much for coming on the show yeah thank you